Joshua chapter 22 with me, if you would. We are in uh, the book of Joshua, making our way through this book. We're, Lord willing, we're going to finish up before the end of the year, and then uh, next year uh, we're going to begin by looking at uh, the book of Judges. So we're here in Joshua chapter 22, and in the book of Joshua, we see God's people going into the promised land. They're conquering, they're finding that God is faithful to fulfill all of his kingdom promises. And that's kind of the main thing that we're looking at as we go through the book of Joshua. And in this section, we're talking about trust in God's kingdom promises, trusting God to continue to deliver on the kingdom promises as he said he would. And in these chapters, we're seeing the, the division of the land by Joshua for all the different tribes of Israel, right? We talked about that last week. And then this morning, and... Uh, we're, we're not going to finish this chapter this morning, but this morning, and I'm, I'm gone next Sunday and the Sunday after that, we'll, we'll finish up uh, two Sundays from now, Lord willing, looking at this chapter as we talk about uh, worship by God's people. And here in this chapter, we see uh, the people wrestling with how to worship God properly and be committed to biblical worship. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to begin here in verse 1 of chapter 22. And we will read through verse 12 this morning. And so if you're able to, in honor of God, as we read his word, if you'd stand with me, Joshua chapter 22, uh, beginning in verse 1, here's what we read. At that time, Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and, and said to them, you have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went to their tents. Now, to one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan, but to the other half, Joshua had given a possession beside their brothers in the land west of the Jordan. And when Joshua sent them away to their homes and blessed them, he said to them, Go back to your tents with much wealth and with very much livestock and silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and with much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. So the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned home, parting from the people of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, their own land, of which they had possessed themselves by command of the Lord through Moses. Verse 10, And when they came to the region of the land that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. And the people of Israel heard it, and the people of Israel heard it, said, Behold, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. You may be seated. May God be blessed and may our hearts be encouraged through the reading of his word this morning. And Father, we do ask for your great name to be glorified uh, through your word. And we pray that uh, we and your, your grace would understand what you're trying to teach us, uh, what this word says to us, and then be diligent to, to love you as a result and be obedient to you. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So this morning and next week, two weeks from now, what I want to do 
is I want to lay out a, a, a vision for biblical corporate worship. I want to lay out a model of, of what it's supposed to look like when, when we, as, as a church, come together on a Sunday morning to worship God. That's, that's my, my goal for this week and, and the next week we get together and look at this passage. That, to lay out a, a biblical model for worship together on a Sunday morning. Now, as I do that, I, I'm going to be touching on other models of worship that, that maybe what, what I'd argue are not as biblical as maybe what we're trying to talk about in, in, as we look at God's word. Now, some of them are some of them are unbiblical. Some of them are just I would argue not the most biblical modes and models of worship, and, and some are just kind of somewhere in in between. All that to say, I want to be really careful that you understand the type of conversation we're having this morning in two weeks. This, this is a family conversation. This is a family for the people who, who attend Bethany Community Church. This is a, to help us grow in our ability to worship well because we do not worship perfectly, okay? We, we do not worship perfectly on a Sunday morning. So I want us as a family to, to grow in that. And my purpose as I talk about other models of worship is not to disparage other brothers and sisters who, who have different, who go to churches who maybe uh, have models of worship that are different than ours. Does, does that make sense? So maybe you're a visitor this morning, you're saying, is, is he, when he talks about that, is he saying that, that my church doesn't love the Lord? Absolutely not. Okay, well, that's not what I'm saying. There are, there are people, brothers and sisters in Christ, who go to churches that have models of worship that I would say that's, that's not the most biblical model of worship, who I would argue probably love the Lord more than I do, many of them, you know. And, and, and so this is not saying that a person who has a different model of worship isn't a Christian. In, in terms of what they do on a Sunday morning, I'm not saying uh, that, but I'm saying my goal, what I want to do, is I want to ask some hard questions about what's supposed to take place on a Sunday morning as we come together to worship the Lord corporately as, as a group of believers. Let's ask ourselves some hard questions about that, Bethany family, and, and grow in our ability to, to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. S some people are, are leaving. Okay, don't leave. <laughs> Made you look. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. Okay. I'll, I'll let to say. A, few, uh, a little while ago, I was having a conversation with a, another pastor, good guy, loves the Lord. And we were talking about our different contexts in which we, we do church ministry. Okay, And he said, you know, my, my church is a, a church of about uh, 5,000 people. And uh, he's, he's in a different area of, of the country than, than, than Peoria, uh, central Illinois. And he said, you know, my church is about 5,000 people. I said, well, that, that, that sounds like a, a really challenging environment. He says, yeah, it is. And he said, what, what we do is we have five services on a weekend and three of our services are what we call outreach services or seeker sensitive type services and two of our services are what we call believer services and i said well, wait what did, what word did you use and well believer services or or uh, growth services or something like that i said well that help, help me help me understand that that sounds uh that that's a, a strange dichotomy to create there so what, what we do is this and in, in our evangelistic or our seeker sensor sensitive services what we're doing is we're, we're having a that kind of some fun songs we're having a very inspirational message and we are uh, having some more creative elements during that that worship service and then our our believer service we have one on saturday night about 150 people and another one on sunday morning and the, the believer services is, is or growth services is for those who want to really grow in their faith and so we have uh, preaching of God's word verse by verse through a text. We have uh, singing biblical songs and we, we, we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper. We do communion in those services. Now, what I would suggest to, to, my, to my friend is I, I don't think you have five worship services, right? I, I think you have two worship services and, and three evangelistic outreaches, right? And in other words, and again, I say this uh, hopefully humbly recognizing we have certainly not arrived where we need to in our, in our worship either, but you have a, a church, what's happening in those three other services are so far removed from the biblical mandates of what needs to take place in a worship service that, that I'm not sure you can call them a church service anymore, right? There's no proclamation of God's 
word. There's not singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's not the participation, the Lord's Supper that, that God tells us is supposed to take place with, with gathered believers. It's, it's not a, a church service anymore because it's not the gathered people of God engaging in worship of God. You say, well, Daniel, that's a strong statement to make. And I hope that as we go through this passage and think about the implications and some other passages as well, you'll, you'll see what, why I'm saying that. And what I would suggest to you this morning is that the abandonment of the biblical elements of worship by, by gospel preaching churches is a relatively new phenomenon. The, the abandonment of those essential things that are supposed to take place in a church service by gospel believing, gospel preaching churches, that's a, a new phenomenon. It's new in our, our Christian culture. For those of you who are younger, it may feel like the way that we do church now and the, the church environment in which we live is the way we've always done it. But in reality, there are some, some fundamental changes. I, I'd argue some very fundamental changes that have taken place over the last decades that have fundamentally altered, in some ways, what it means to, to, to go to church. And young people, you can insert your own OK Boomer joke right here, okay? But there's fundamental things that have shifted here. So, for example, I was, I was reading a book, and they were talking about some of this. And uh, here, here's some things that I found very striking. In, in 1990, in 1990, which isn't that long ago, in my opinion, uh, there were only 10 churches. There were only 10 churches in the United States that would consider them. That, consider themselves something called multi-site churches. In other words, only 10 churches in all the United States would say we're a church, we're all one church, we have the same leadership, but we meet in multiple locations. That's, that's a new phenomenon. Today there are over 5,000 churches that would say that they're a multi-site church. In 1960, I think it was 1960, there were fewer than 20 mega churches in the United States. So 20 churches or fewer, I believe, that would be over 2,000 people. Now today, there are more megachurches just in Nashville than there used to be in the entire United States. Now, is that good? Is that bad? Is it unbiblical? We'll kind of talk through that. But certainly, I think we can all agree it's different, right? It's different, that experience. The idea of, of singing has changed pretty radically over the last few decades. Uh, Worship Matters by Bob Coughlin kind of documents some of this. But the idea that, that a church should, should be a, a concert experience as opposed to a congregation singing, for those of us who are younger, we may not realize that that's a change, but that's a very fundamental change in what it means to, to go to church. For most of church history, going to church has meant that the people of God, believers, gather together at, at one time in one place and engage in worship of God. That's not an idea that we hold in common any longer. And, and what I want to suggest to you this morning, my, my concern is that as we change what it means to, to go to church, we're not aware that that's happened, and we're not asking ourselves, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? What elements of this are good? What elements of this are unbiblical? And again, as we come to this text... And as you look at the, the passage that Kirk read earlier, you see that worship of God and worshiping God rightly is a big deal. And so it's important for us as a church to, to look at God's word together and say, okay, God, what do you want us to do with this time on a Sunday morning? What are the, what are the elements that need to take up this, this time so that we do this in a way that, that honors and glorifies you? That's what we need to be thinking about together. And that's my goal for our time together this morning. Here in this chapter, we see a group of people who are, are passionate that God not be worshipped wrongly by the people who are part of their community of faith. And that's what we want to, to do as well. We want to say, okay, our, our goal isn't to disparage other very godly Christians in our community in the world who have a different worship style or philosophy. Again, there are many people that uh, I would love very dearly who would say they have a different model of what's best, but I want us to pursue what's best in the sense of what's most biblical and as we evaluate what we're doing on a Sunday morning. Here's, here's a central idea this week and next time we look at this passage. So Bethany Community Church, family, let's joyfully commit ourselves 
Let's joyfully commit ourselves as a church to passionate, God-directed, Christ-centered, spirit-filled worship. As the body of Christ that meets at this location on a Sunday morning, let's commit ourselves, like we're going to, to passionately do what God has directed, what God says for us to do in his word. We're going to have Christ at the center of that worship, and that the worship is going to be spirit-filled, spirit-directed, trusting upon the Holy Spirit's work in our lives for us to be able to do what we could not do in and of ourselves. Okay, so that's, that's what we're trying to do. And what we're going to do is we're going to see that we've been, in this text, we're going to talk about how we've been called to biblical worship. And really, that's most of what we're going to talk about this morning. I don't think I'm going to get beyond that. We're going to talk about being called to biblical worship. And then we're going to be talking about confronting unbiblical worship in our, in our lives. We're going to talk about committing corporately to biblical worship. And then we're going to talk about celebrating biblical worship as God provides it. Okay, so here's the first thing. We're going to talk about being called to biblical worship. Look at the text with me if you would, right? And here's, here's what's happening. As we went through these last chapters, really chapters uh, 14, 13 through chapter uh, 20, 21, what did we see? We saw Joshua and the other leaders dividing up the inheritance. Okay, so you get this area, you get this area, you get this area, and you get this area. And remember, there's, there's 12 tribes, and the tribe of Levi doesn't get an inheritance. The Lord is their inheritance. We talked about that last week. And that leaves 11 tribes. So the tribe of Joseph has been divided into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, his two sons. And so that brings us to 12, 12 territories that need to be assigned. And if you remember from the Pentateuch, and we also talked about this uh, recently in the book of Joshua, there were two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh. These tribes said, okay, the, the promised land is on the west side of the Jordan River. We want our inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River. That's, that's where we want our inheritance to be. And so Moses gave it to them, and he said, okay, I'm going to give you this inheritance on this side of the river, but here's what you need to do. Whenever we come in to conquer the land that God has, has given us, you need to come with us. And Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh said, you bet, we'll do it. And they came and they, they went and they've been a part of conquering. And now that time of conquering is over. And Joshua brings them before him. It says he summoned them in verse 1. And he says, you, you've done it, right? You, you've kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. You've obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. So you obeyed Moses, you obeyed me. You haven't forsaken your brothers these many days down to, to, to today. You've been careful to keep the charge of the Lord. And, and now God has given rest to your brothers and you can go back to your territory. And then look what he says in verse 5. He says, only be very careful. Be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. He's warning them to continue to worship Yahweh. And the rest of the chapter is going to deal with the question is, did they keep that charge that Joshua gave them or not? In fact, the words that, that Joshua uses here in verse 5 are very similar to words that we saw Moses use in the book of Deuteronomy. There's this, this pattern of knowing God, loving God, and obeying him with true worship, right? Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses says, listen to the statutes, O Israel, and the rules that I'm teaching you. Do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. I've, I've taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you're entering to take possession of them. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding, the sight of the peoples who, when they hear of all the things, these, these statutes, they'll say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as, as Yahweh, as the Lord our God, is to us whenever we call upon him. Again, it's that you need to know these things about God, and then you need to, oh, then you need to love him, and then you need to obey him. He goes on in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. Moses does. He says, watch yourselves carefully. Uh, don't, 
Don't make idols for yourselves. Don't, don't make likenesses of animals. Uh, don't make likenesses of birds, the likeness of anything that, that creeps on the ground. Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven when you see the, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the hosts of heaven. You be drawn away and bow to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has, has allotted to all the peoples under the heaven. He's, he's warning them. Moses is warning them against idolatry. He says, look, you need to, to take these words that I've given you here in, in God's word, these commandments that I've given you, and, and study them. Know them carefully. Understand who Yahweh is. And as you understand who Yahweh is, Deuteronomy 6, what do you do? You, you love him. And as you love him, what do you do? You obey him. That's what Joshua is saying to the people as well. Know who God is. Understand biblical truths about who he is. Look at his special rev- revelation. One translation translates what he's saying here in Joshua 22.5 as, as everything that Moses has commanded you needs to be observed or kept. There's knowledge that's necessary for obedience. And as they, as they know these things, they, they love. They contemplate who God is and they respond with, with love. You can't love someone that you don't know. So know these things about who God is. Grow in your understanding of him. And the more you understand him, the, the deeper your love will be. Sometimes when a, a husband and wife are in a, in a conflict, you may, you may hear one of them say to the other, look, you, you don't even know me. Like, you don't know these, these things about me. I was listening to a, a radio song a couple, I don't know how long ago it was, but there's a, it's by... Um, Ben Folds and, and Regina Spector, that this is couple having this conversation. And it begins, the, the song begins with a couple realizing that they don't really, that the other person doesn't know who they are. I can't, um, I can't sing, obviously. We'll talk about that later as we talk about biblical worship. How does someone who can't sing engage in biblical worship? But um, he, he, the song goes something like this, that the man says, I, I want to ask you, do you ever sit and wonder that it's so strange we could ever be together for so long and never know, never care what goes on in the other's head. Isn't it weird? We've, we've been together for so long and we don't know and we don't even care what the other person is thinking about. The, the man continues, things I felt but I've never said. You said things that I never said, so I'll say something now that I should have said long ago. And she says, say it. And then he drops this bombshell. You don't know me at all. You don't know me. You don't know me at all. And then he says, you you could have just propped me up on a table like a mannequin or a cardboard stand up and and paint me any face you wanted me to be seen. It's tragic in a relationship. When a person who who you think loves you, you come to the realization, not only did they not love me, they don't even know who I am. They've created some caricature of me, some, some, some creature that isn't even really me, and that's the person that they love. It's devastating in in a human relationship. It's idolatry in our relationship with God. Joshua tells these tribes as they're getting ready to go, No, K-N-O-W, know who God is. Know these commandments that I've given you. And and then love. And then as you love, obey. Engage in worship that is is fueled by a love of God. That that love of God is so central. You, You can't love God without knowing him, and you can't love God without obeying him through worship. And that's what is happening here in these first few verses of Joshua 22. They're being called to know who God is and worship him as they love him. And this right worship of God is very carefully regulated. If these two and a half tribes go back to the east side of the river and they start engaging in idolatry and they start engaging in worship like the Canaanites have engaged and they start doing all these things, if they start doing those things, what does it reveal? It reveals they do not know who God is and they do not truly love him. Just because they take the name Yahweh and and slap it onto their worship doesn't mean they've engaged in true worship of Yahweh. And that's what Joshua is cautioning them, just as Moses cautioned them years before, look, 
look, if you're going to worship God, you need to worship him as he has declared to you that he is to be worshipped. If you start engaging in idolatry, if you worship him in places and in ways he is not said to be worshipped, you are not worshipping Yahweh. And brothers and sisters, the same is true for you and me. And what I want to spend the most of the rest of our time together this morning asking ourselves is is this question. What does God want our worship to look like? What does God want the people at Bethany Community Church on Sunday morning morning to do when when they come in to this room? Or you could ask it this way. What do people who love God do when they worship? And the answer is not whatever they want to do, right? A, a person who just says, well, I love God, and so I'm going to worship him any way that I desire to worship him is not someone who truly loves God. A person who loves God has to know who he is and then walk in obedience to him. It's important, I think, for each of us in our hearts to first realize that worship of God on a Sunday morning is a big deal when we come together to corporately worship and and also to individually recognize I've certainly failed in this area. I mean, just on the, on the, on a bottom level, whenever Joshua tells me you're loving with your whole heart and your soul, I think all of us this morning could say, but even, even this morning as as I love singing the songs and as I love coming to God's word, I have not loved him perfectly with my whole heart and soul. And so just at a very fundamental level, I've failed. As I've wrestled with this for our church, I've realized it's, it's not always easy to pinpoint exactly where we've failed in our engagement of biblical worship or our failure to engage in biblical worship. Sometimes our failures are blatant, you know. If you ever, if you ever um, have me, you ever see me stand up on a morning and say, you know what, um, I was going to read the Bible this morning, but I had this really cool article from The Economist that I'd speak from in, instead. Like, that's obvious, complete failure, Leave the room, right? But sometimes our our failures are more subtle. It's not that we're necessarily doing something blatantly unbiblical. It's that we're not engaging God in worship the way that he's called us to worship him. There's a a book that I mentioned several months ago that I read. Uh, It's called The Gospel, I think this is right, The Gospel Driven Church by Jared Wilson. And in that book, he tells a story about a pastor who was kind of wrestling with this, this issue with his, with his church, wondering if they were engaging in worship as God would call them to, to worship. And he, he realizes that the failures that he's, he's led the church in were not blatant failures, not very obvious failures, but, but more subtle. So, for example, there's a, a chapter with the subtitle, Not Everything That Counts Can Be Counted. And the pastor is, is leading a staff meeting, and, and he's talking with the, the staff about how he's struggling with some of these things. And he holds up, and they're asking, well, what exactly do you mean by we need to in, improve in our biblical worship and so forth? And he, he holds up a banner that the church had had from a slogan several years ago. And the, the, the slogan on the banner was, 2000 by 2005. In other words, we went 2,000 people in our church by 2005. And as, as the, the staff talks about it, they realize that's, that's not an unbiblical goal. Like, it's not a bad thing to say we want 2,000 people worshiping the Lord on a Sunday morning, right? I mean, that's, that's not a bad thing. But here's, here's what the pastor said. He said, our, our focus was wrong. He says, in, in the 22 years since we've planted the church, I'm not sure we've had our eyes ever had our eyes on the right prize. In other words, sometimes our failure in worship is is not so much the things that we're doing, it's the things that we are not focused on doing. So it's not wrong to have a goal to to have 2,000 people worshiping the Lord, but to say, okay, that's our goal and that's our focus can cause us to neglect other things. And maybe we've felt this type of tension in other areas as well. But here's, here's what I want us to think about. 
What does God want us to do on a Sunday morning? There's something called the regulative principle that many Christians have historically held to. And it, it just tells us, look, everything we do in corporate worship needs to be something that is instructed by God to do in his word, either, either clearly instructed in his word or, or biblical application of a principle. And good Christians have disagreed about how exactly to, to implement this. But I think we can all say this, look, we need to do everything that Scripture commands us to do when we worship God. We must avoid all the things that Scripture tells us we're to not do, right? And so here's, I want to, and again, the rest of our time, I want us to think about just five areas that should, that, that describe what should be taking place on a Sunday morning as we gather. There are some subcategories of these or some other things you could put in this as well. But here, here are five big areas that need to take place whenever a church gathers together to worship the Lord. And some of these things uh, may take up more time one Sunday than the next. But in terms of, of just as you look at a month or a year of a church's life together, these are, these are five things that must be happening as a church gathers. Number one, we need to read the word, right? What needs to happen as our church comes together to worship the Lord? On a Sunday morning, we need to read the word. What does Paul tell Timothy? First Timothy 4, 13. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. The, the reading of the word of God shows that it's God's word that's going to serve as our, as our ultimate source of authority. It's going to shape our, our practices as a church. The reading of God's word it tells us as individuals, and it tells us as, as families, it tells us as the family of God who worship here on a Sunday morning. It tells us, look, this is our ultimate source of authority. Our authority is not in what Daniel or another elder might say. Our, that's not our ultimate authority. Our ultimate authority isn't what we vote on as, as a church to do. That's not where the congregation doesn't have the ultimate authority either. Ultimately, all of us are in subjection to the authority of God, and that authority of God is revealed in his word. As we read God's word, we're saying that this is where our source of authority is. This is where our source of life is as we think about what we're going to, to do in order to walk with the Lord, how to live our lives, how to, how to engage as, as singles, or how to engage as a married couple or as, as families. We need to come to God's word as our source of authority. Hebrews 4.12 Hebrews 4.12 says, the, the word of God is, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the, of the heart. As we come together as a church, we read the word because we believe that it is in the word that we find words of eternal life. And so we read the word. What's the second thing we do? The second thing we do is we preach the word. We preach the word. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4. Paul says, I, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and, and by his appearing as his kingdom. This is Paul talking to this pastor Timothy. He says, I charge you by God and by Jesus, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with, with complete patience and teaching. The time is coming, Paul tells Timothy, when people won't endure sound teaching. They won't want to listen to good teaching. But, but having itching ears, they'll, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. But as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul tells Timothy, preach. Preach. And the content of that preaching isn't your thoughts. It's not a, a self-esteem message. It's not a, a message from the, the latest uh, TED Talk. The content of your discourse needs to be God's word. And I believe that this is an important thing for us to think about because we really don't understand sometimes what preaching is. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous uh, pastor from a, a previous generation, uh, he said that part of our failure to understand what preaching is uh, can, can fall on pastors. He said there's a temptation for pastors to be pulpiteers, not preachers. In other words, uh, to be people who, who, who present as opposed to preach. Listen, listen to what he writes. He says, 
by pulpiteers, he says, there are men who can occupy a pulpit and dominate it and, and dominate the people. They're, they're professionals. There's a good deal of the element of showmanship in, in pulpiteers. They're experts at handling congregations and playing on their emotions. He says the form becomes more important than the substance. The oratory style and eloquence become things in and of themselves. And ultimately, preaching becomes a form of entertainment. The, the truth is noticed. There's a passing respect to it. But the great thing is a form. The great thing is, is entertainment. Now, this is why I commit to no fun at all. Whenever I preach, you know, nothing amusing, right? Uh, don't want anyone enjoying themselves, right? No, that's, that's not the case. But, but what is preaching? Listen to what Lloyd, Lloyd Jones goes on. He says, what, what is preaching? There is a man standing in a pulpit and, he, and he's talking. And, and there are people sitting in pews or, or seats and listening. What is happening? What, what, what is this? Why does that man stand there? What's his point? What's his object? And, and why does the church put him there to do thus? Why do they stay? Why do these people listen? What is this man doing there? And he says, any true definition of preaching must say that man is there to deliver the message of God, a message from God to those people. In other words, he's not there to talk or entertain them. He's there to influence them with, with God's word. Preaching, preaching is explaining God's word to God's people with the goal of, of influencing them to, to become more like Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit as he allows them to understand and apply his word. It's not easy, right? I mean, first of all, uh, my, my, my job is tough. Every week is an incredible struggle for me. It's, it's something, when I, in the weeks that I'm preaching, it's something that is always on my mind. If it's something that, that dominates my thoughts from, uh, you know, 1230 in the afternoon on Sunday until uh, 1045 on a Sunday morning. It's, and I guess my, I'm, maybe all the time because I'm still thinking about what I'm talking to you, right? It's something that, that dominates my thinking. If you're around me on a, a, a Saturday, you're on a car trip with me, I'm not a fun person. I'm, I'm talking about the sermon. I'm trying to help me understand this. It's, it's something that's, that's a constant struggle for me. Well, last night, I had a, um, a, a nightmare about preaching. I, that's often my, my dreams on a Saturday night. I, last night, I was dreaming that, that I couldn't find my notes. So I tried to make my way up to teach. Not, not, a, good, not a good night, right? That's, that's a common thing, not an easy job. But you don't have an easy job as well, right? It's not e I understand it is not easy to sit there for 40 minutes or so and, and listen and, and, and pay attention to God's word. That is not an easy thing to do. And if it was easy, if it was easy, uh, we wouldn't need to grow in it, right? How are we doing in our, in our preaching? Well, obviously awesome. But <laughs> it's something we have to grow in, right? We come together as a Sunday morning and we say, okay, look, I, I'm, I'm coming here not because this is the, the funnest thing from, a, from an entertainment point that I could do on a Sunday morning. It would be far more entertaining to, to, to sleep in and, and watch Netflix. I mean, that's, that's or now Disney Plus. Um, that's, an, that's a fun thing to do. But I'm coming here because I believe it's valuable because I'm part of the people of God. God calls me to this, and I believe that it's in this time together that I will grow in my understanding of who God is. And as I come to know who God is, I will grow in my love for him, and I will be able to obey him. God calls me to this, this, this time of listening to his word taught, and I'm going to do it with joy. A third thing is this. We also, as we gather together, we, we pray the word. We pray the word. Paul tells Timothy again, 1 Timothy says, I, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and for all who are on high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. And I think this is an area where we've grown and continue to grow as a church. At a time where we come together as a church and worship must include a time of, of praying the word. We're praying biblical prayers as we gather together. What has God told us to pray? That's what we're praying as we come together to worship. A fourth thing we do, of course, is we sing the word. We sing the word. 
Paul says in first uh, in Ephesians 5 he says as you gather together you're, you're to address one another in in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the Lord with with your heart we as we gather together we're we're, we're singing psalms hymns spiritual words biblically singing truths to one another now as i mentioned i i'm not a singer right i'm not someone who's who sings well uh, some people is when they speak and have a microphone on they're, they're nervous about leaving the microphone on when they go to the restroom or something nervous about that but i'm even more nervous that i will forget to turn off the microphone when we're singing like i think that would be that would be very bad sometimes i do leave it on and and the, the people who are up here can hear me in their headphones. And if you see them wincing, you know what's happened there, right? So if I was just going to engage in worship as I might decide, maybe I, I wouldn't sing. But, but God has told me, look, singing is part of, of worshiping me. And when I come together with the people of God, I hear those who can sing well, and those who can't sing as well. Engaging in worship of God, singing biblical truths to one another, my, my soul is refreshed and encouraged, and my, my faith in the Lord grows. I find joy in Mike's ministry and other people's ministry of music in ways that only God can can. can gain credit for we must sing and the content of our singing is not the latest pop music that maybe has some sort of biblical message if we squint hard enough we sing biblical truths to one another and i'm grateful for those who help us do so and then the final thing final big category to think of as we as we gather together we we see the word we see the word we see the word in our participation in things like the lord's supper as other Christ followers gather together, we, 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 as there's a corporate gathering as we see Christ in one another as we engage in worship. We don't see the word at home, just studying the Bible by ourselves in the same way as we do when we come together as a church and participate in the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11 describes this, this process of gathering together as a believer to express our worship of God together. I'm going to stop there for this morning. There's other things we can mention and, and things we will continue to mention. Other things that need to happen as the church gathers together. There's greetings, there's collection of tithes, those sorts of things. But these are the, the big five areas that I would, I would encourage us to think about this morning as we first of all think about our, our, how we've been called to worship. Now there's other things we're going to talk about. It's, it's, what, it's not enough just to get together and do these things. There's a heart attitude that needs to take place and the, the spirit needs to work. We'll talk about that in two weeks but let's by god's grace let's commit let's joyfully commit ourselves as a church as those who've been saved by placing our faith in jesus christ alone for our salvation as, as those people who've gathered together let's joyfully commit ourselves to god-directed christ-centered spirit-filled worship let me pray for us father we thank you for your word we thank you for the ability we have uh, through the work of your son Jesus, through the enabling work of your spirit to worship you. We pray that we be faithful uh, to worship you as, you've, as you have called us to worship you. Help us to, to flee idolatry. Help us to flee uh, self-worship and instead engage in worship of you that allows us to know and love you more and be obedient to you as a result. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.